Mr. Majewski's Anatomy 32 class. This lecture is on Chapter 2, which covers cells. And here is an image of an artistic rendition of a cell. You will never see a cell like this in the real world. So cell theory was developed in the 1800s, and it states that all living things are made up of cells. And therefore, something that does not have a cell is not a living thing. Uh, the smallest unit of life is the cell, therefore to be alive you have to have at least one cell. And cells arise from other living cells by cell division. No spontaneous generation here. If you look at a cell, it has three principal parts. It has the plasma membrane, the cytoplasm, which is everything between the plasma membrane and the nucleus, and the nucleus, which is the largest organelle in a cell, and houses the cell's DNA. Please note this is a eukaryotic cell since we're focusing on human anatomy here. Bacteria look quite different and are much, much smaller. So the plasma membrane is made up of what's called the lipid bilayer. If you look at the lipid bilayer, you can see that it is composed of two similar looking structures. These are phospholipids, where you have the phosphates that are charged on the outside and on the inside is the fatty acid chains, which are not charged. And the fatty acid chains are hydrophobic. They fear water, so they will interact with each other, while the phosphates are hydrophilic or water-loving. So they're on the outside, adjacent to the extracellular fluid, which is water-based, or the cytosol inside the cell, which is also water-based. And this structure, the lipid bilayer, allows for selective permeability. So some things can pass through the membrane, while other things cannot. If you continue to look at the plasma membrane, you see that there are other structures in and on the plasma membrane. For instance, there are integral proteins. Integral proteins are any proteins that are embedded into the plasma membrane or pass completely through the plasma membrane. Another set of proteins are the peripheral proteins. Peripheral proteins are proteins that lie on the plasma membrane or are attached directly to an integral protein. You also see that some proteins have carbohydrate chains coming off of them. These proteins can be referred to as glycoproteins. Glyco for carbohydrate, protein for, well, being a protein. Also, you can see that some of the uh, lipids in the lipid bilayer are actually glycolipids because instead of having a phosphate group, they have a carbohydrate chain attached to them. So some of the basic functions of the membrane proteins. One is to allow things to pass through the membrane. For instance, this channel protein here is of a particular size and will let anything that size or smaller pass through the membrane. They can be enzymes that catalyze specific reactions. Often you'll have some sort of messenger bind to a receptor on the surface of a cell, and this will then eventually lead to chemical reactions that can occur potentially at the surfaces of the cell. These proteins can also link to neighboring cells so that you have proteins on one cell attaching to proteins on neighboring cells, keeping them together. This is very important for things like tissues. And then finally, cells can be important in the role, I'm sorry, not cells, proteins can be important in the role of cell identity markers. Basically, they allow the, your immune system to distinguish cells that are self, that are you, versus cells that are coming from invaders. And these are often the glycoproteins that have these markers. And as I said before, things must transport across the plasma membrane. There are two ways this can happen, through passive transport, which is along a concentration or electrical gradient, basically going from high to low. And it requires no energy input from the cell, so this is basically free. Examples of passive transport include diffusion, especially common among lipid-soluble solutes, that they go from high concentration to low, passing through the lipid bilayer without any, need, any needed intermediate. 
You're also going to have osmosis. Osmosis is only for water molecules, which can also pass through the lipid bilayer. And then there's facilitated diffusion. Again, this is where you would have some sort of channel protein that allow only uh, solutes or molecules of particular size to pass through. Again, from high concentrations to low concentrations. Then there is active transport. Active transport is basically the opposite of passive transport. It moves the substance against the concentration or electrical gradient. And so this will require energy from the cell. So with active transport, you would need some sort of ATP molecule, which is the energy currency of the cell. That will be broken down to ADP and an inorganic phosphate. That will release energy, allowing that integral protein to take a molecule from a high concentration, uh, low concentration, sorry, and release it to the side where that molecule is at high concentration. So again, active transport going from low to high, requiring an energy source. Other forms of active transport use vesicles. In the two most common cases are endocytosis and exocytosis. In endocytosis, the adjacent plasma membrane will surround or engulf uh, the particle of interest. In some cases, this can be a food particle. Other cases, it can be an invading organism. Basically, pseudopods form from, project out from the surface of the cell and engulf that particle. And that particle will then be in what's called a vesicle, which is a small sphere of plasma membrane which is now referred to as just the lipid bilayer. Exocytosis is basically opposite. With exocytosis, a vesicle is formed inside the cell, and, in, and inside the vesicle will be molecules or substances to be excreted, and then this vesicle will fuse with the plasma membrane, releasing what's inside into the extracellular fluid. Um, probably the most well-known forms of endocytosis is referred to as phagocytosis. This is when an immune cell, such as a white blood cell, will engulf an invading microbe in order to protect us from the invader. So again, it will form pseudopods that will surround the microbe and bring it into the cell, and then that microbe will basically be digested. Also, it's worth to point out that some organisms, such as viruses, have found ways to hijack the whole endocytosis process in order to get themselves brought into that cell in order to infect it. Uh, this is referred to as receptor-mediated endocytosis. So the second uh, major portion of the cell is the cytoplasm, everything between the plasma membrane and the nucleus. Within the cytoplasm, you have the fluid portion, which is referred to as the cytosol. Now, this fluid portion, while aqueous-based, is not really as liquidy as we like to think of fluids. It's actually more like a uh, consistency of toothpaste. And within the cytosol are many structures, including organelles, which are specialized structures that do specialized functions. Now, one specialized structure found in the cytosol is the cytoskeleton. Much like our skeleton, it helps provide the structure of the cell. So the cytoskeleton serves as a scaffold for the cell, and also the cytoskeleton serves as a highway for the cell. It allows things inside the cell to move from place to place. There are three main kinds of um, filaments found as part of the cytoskeleton. The smallest of these is called the microfilament, and it is found mostly along the surface of the cell and is important in movement of the cell, such as forming those pseudopods, and also in mechanical support. And as you can see here in this picture, the microfilaments are very key to the formation of structures called microvillus, or macrovilli for plural, which is found mostly in cells that are engaged in a lot of absorption, such as cells in the small intestine. The second kind of filaments found to be uh, parts of the cytoskeleton are the intermediate filaments, 
which are larger than the microfilaments. And they are found scattered throughout the body of the cell, as well as at the surface of the cell. And they help anchor organelles within the cell, putting them in the correct places, and also anchor cells to one another. And then the third type of filament is the microtubule, which is the largest of the cytoskeletal filaments. And as you can see, the proteins actually form a tube. So there's a hollow space within the center of the microtubule. And the microtubule also is important in helping to determine the cell shape. And it's also involved in the movement of particular structures of the cell. So for instance, the microtubules are key structures in making up the cilia and the flagellum, which are protrusions from the cell. The flagellum being a long tail-like structure that in, is involved in movement of a cell. And the only human cell that has a flagellum is sperm cells. And cilia are smaller protrusions, often many on any one cell, that move basically to cause things outside the cell to move. So that is this portion of the Chapter 2 lecture.